I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, Victory. We are so glad that you're in the house. Maybe you're watching online. We invite you to stand. We're going to enter a time of worship and celebration to the King of Kings this morning. Sing together. The King can lose his balance. He's never caught off guard. His throne will not be.
ask for his provision. I'm gonna call on him. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, who's loving to the generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same.
kids to chauffeur around, we've got meetings to get to, phone calls, traveling all over the place. This is a design time that we can rest, take a breath, focus in, look at our priorities. And this is an opportunity to, to communicate with the God of the universe, the God that has made everything that we see, everything that we don't see. This is an opportunity to run to him. Yes, he chases after us, but he 
wants us to come to him with our burdens, come to him with our sorrows, come with him, come to him with our gratitude and our thankfulness. There's, there's seasons of life in here. We're all going through different things. This is an opportunity to, to communicate. And so we wanna have that time dedicated every Sunday. It's important. It's a, it's a, it's a recalibration. It's a refocus uh, as we get ready to start another week. So I wanna pray and then we're gonna take communion uh, together. God, thank you. God, thank you for songs like Run of the Father. Lord, that, that you're, you're here, you, you, you want us, you want us to come to you. The God of the universe cares what we have to say, cares how we feel. And, and man, what, a, what an opportunity it is to, to be able to communicate with you, to, to, to share our desires, to share our grief, to share our thankfulness. God, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would be talked to. Lord, that we would use this time each week to be able to, to communicate how we feel. And God, we know that you care because you sent your one and only son, Jesus, into the world to die for our sins, to, to give us hope, to, to give us forgiveness of our sins, to give us the promise and the hope of eternity. God, what, what, a, what a beautiful thing it is to be called a child of God. So Lord, as children, we are, we're running to the Father today. God, may you hear us, Lord, may we feel heard, may we feel cared for, and God, may we bring you our concerns and our gratitude. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, for him crucified, for him resurrected. God, we, we give you glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome you guys this morning. How you guys doing this morning? Amazing. Hey, great stuff. Yeah. If you're watching online with us today uh, here at Victory, we love to celebrate first-time guests. And this last Easter weekend, we had over 50 first-time guests. Isn't that pretty amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And, and if that's if you're a first-time guest here today, we want to invite you to text NEW to 317-576-22. 8, 8, or scan the QR code if you're here in person on the seat back in front of you. Or if you're watching online, just click the link. They're provided for you. Uh, if you're here in service, uh, go to the Connection Center in the lobby because uh, we have a free gift we want to give to you. And we want to send you if you're out there on the line. Uh, but uh, if, no matter if you're here for two weeks or 20 years, we want to invite each and every one of you to check in through the Victory app so that we can know you're here. It helps us to better care for and follow up with your family. Uh, but something that we love to celebrate here at Victory is generosity. Uh, we want to be known as a generous church. And what I am excited to share with you in this moment is together, together we sacrifice for change locally and globally. No, not one of us did this by ourselves, but 87 families sacrificed to change lives forever. And together we raise $39,942.28. Yeah, great job. Yeah, that was that's pretty awesome. Now, now here's how we broke that down. Twenty-five thousand dollars is going to be sent to southeastern Ukraine uh, to TCI. They're on the very front lines of bringing hope to people in Ukraine. So that's amazing. And then we split the rest in half. Seven thousand four hundred seventy-one dollars and fourteen cents is going to be right here in Johnson County. Uh, we're going to give it to the food pantry because at the heart of Jesus is feeding hungry people. Another $7,000, $471.14 uh, is going to be used here to help position us to be ready to respond to some of the needs that come up in our community in Franklin. 
Whiteland, Edinburgh, and Indy with Danny and Victory in the City. There's so much need, so much opportunity. But if you still want to give, you can participate today. It's still open. Uh, now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are perfectionists, and, and you're thinking, $39,942.28. Why didn't they just round it off? Couldn't somebody have written a check to make it $40,000? Good news is you could do that. $57.72. Uh, $57.72. You can do that through our app or on our website or even the good old-fashioned check. And we're giving 100% of that away. Uh, we have the offering boxes in the back as you exit or down the stairs. And I'm so excited to be able to share with you, see what God is going to do through our collective sacrifice. And in the future weeks, we'll be reporting back to you about where your money is going. Now, you might not know this next part, uh, but as a staff, we have six staff values. We call those values the pathway to victory. Uh, it's how we lead, how we care for, how we guide uh, people. And we value these things. And one of our values is make it better. Make it better. Whatever we're doing, we want to make it better next week. And so we welcome feedback. We embrace change and we work together to make whatever it is we're doing better. So today, uh, we're going to need your help in doing that. Every year about this time, uh, we make an effort to make victory better. And so uh, in the service, we're going to take a survey. Uh, and if you're a high school student or older, we need to hear from you. So we want your help in helping us make it better. And we want as many people to take this survey as possible. I Just be transparent. If it was Becky and I, I'd be like, you got this. Now we want both of you to potentially do this. So we'd love to hear from you. The more people in your family, the better. And just uh, take a second and take a screenshot. It's gonna, they're going to show it on the screen. If you're watching online, never been to the building before, we still want to hear from you as well. We're going to take the next three minutes and you are going to help us make it better.
Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You're probably thinking, easier said than done, right? Who is my neighbor? What did Jesus mean by neighbor anyway? We're well-intentioned in sharing the love of Jesus, but if we're honest, we're not usually sure where to begin. We've tried things that didn't work or that just felt downright awkward. So how do we best share the love of Jesus with those around us? Well, Jesus tells us. Better yet, He shows us by using five simple practices that Jesus demonstrates throughout the Gospels, we can learn how to bless our neighbor. When we bless our neighbor, we love our neighbor. And a love like that could change the world again. So how do we love our neighbor? B-L-E-S-S. -S. I want to kick off our time together with kind of a heavy question, uh, but here's the question. Are you ever overwhelmed by the need in the world? And you turn on the news or you open up social media, uh, you see the war in Ukraine that you can't stop. Or maybe this last week you got back from Easter, you visited with your family, and ever since last week you've been worrying about somebody in your family because you heard the news that someone in your family, someone that you love, someone that you care about is struggling and you don't know how to help. Someone is failing out of school and you're not the teacher. Someone has an upcoming surgery and you're definitely not a surgeon. Yeah, you, and maybe it's a cancer diagnosis and you know you don't have the cure. Maybe it's a, a marriage headed towards divorce and you just know, I, I'm not a counselor. I don't know how to help. Or it's an addiction that you just can't seem to heal. And as you look around the world, as you look at the people that you love, as you look at your family, do you ever, are you ever overwhelmed by the need in the world? Does that ever happen to you? I don't know about you, but transparently, when I look around at all of the needs that are in this world, it just seems so great. The pain that people feel just seems like too much. And I look at my own experience and my own training, I think, well, what do I have to offer? You know, everything that I could think of just seems so small. I honestly feel ill-equipped to handle all of the needs in the world. And actually, many ministers feel the exact same way I do. In fact, uh, we have this little saying that when we get together, we'll talk to each other. And whenever we're overwhelmed or whenever uh, so someone will try to, to break up the silence with a little bit of laughter, they'll say something a little bit like this. I bet they didn't teach you that in Bible college. I bet they didn't teach you that in Bible college. And, and, and they didn't. Like there was no class to tell us how to properly care for an addicted brother. They didn't teach you that in Bible college. There's no class to tell you how to heal a relationship where the father and son are out there beating each other up in the street. They'll teach you that. We never had a lecture about how to heal every marriage that's been shaken with infidelity. They don't give you the words for all of that. They, they didn't give me the words when I was at the house of one of our college students and I had to tell her parents that she died in a car wreck on the way to school. They didn't give me the words for that. They never prepared me when I'd have to sit down with the family that I love and care about and tell them that dad's not coming home. They, they never prepared me for words like that or, or the perfect words to say to the grandfather who backed up over his son accidentally, his four-year-old grandson. They didn't give me the words for that. They never say, hey, that night you'll be in a parking lot standing between a son screaming at death threats at his father and, and you're going to have the magic words for that moment. I, they never, never went over that. That there were no magical words to solve everything. They didn't teach me that in Bible college. Now here, here's what I know. Is I care about you. I, I know that God knows and he sees and he cares and he loves the people that I get to minister to. But too often I am overwhelmed by the need in this world. And even if you're here today and you're on the edges of faith, I, I know that you care about the people around you too. And so today, we get the opportunity together to look at a text where Jesus shares what we are to do when we are overwhelmed by the need in the world, how we are to respond 
And now, if you wouldn't call yourself a Jesus follower, the good news for you is you don't have to do any of this. You can just sit back and listen and go, oh, those Jesus followers, they should be doing that because I know what Jesus says to do. You don't have to do any of this. This is optional. But if you're a Jesus follower, you say, I try to follow Jesus, I, this is what, what we need to realize. Is I ask you this question all the time, but here's the simple question is, what do Jesus followers do? And it's no trick question. What, what's the answer? Is they follow Jesus? Right? It's so simple. Like whatever Jesus would say, whatever Jesus calls us to do, that's what Jesus would call us to do. And, and what Jesus says in this text is so relevant, so insightful, so life-changing. If everybody in your family just took this one teaching of Jesus seriously for one month, it would change your family even if your family doesn't follow Jesus. If everybody in our community would take seriously this one command of Jesus seriously, it would change this community. If they did that for a month, I'm telling you, it is powerful. So if you have your Bible or mobile device, please turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. And we're going to take you to the second year in Jesus' ministry around 27 AD. And Jesus is getting ready to share a famous parable. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus is t- telling his followers, what it would look like to look like their father in heaven. So Jesus is trying to help us understand what heaven might look like. And he gives his followers, us, an assignment in bringing heaven to earth. So, but before we get to that parable, I want to give you the setup. So Jesus is teaching in front of the Jewish lawyers uh, who would have been schooled in the religious laws of the Old Testament. So he would have had to memorize terrible books of the Bible like Leviticus and Deuteronomy. A struggle to get through, honest. But he would know the laws by heart. He would know the laws that God gave his people and he knows the laws that they have to keep to be in good standing with God. And in the middle of Jesus teaching, this religious expert, he he raises his hand and asks a question to try to stump Jesus. It says this, one day an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, teacher, what should we do to inherit eternal life? In other words, Jesus, how do I get to heaven? How do I avoid hell? And Jesus, what are the religious rules that I'm going to have to keep to get me into heaven? Because I'm not keeping all of them, right? So, so what do I have to do? And I, I want to point out that this religious leader believed that he could actually do something to earn heaven. Jesus followers don't believe that. Jesus followers believe that Jesus paid the price. But he says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And even though he asks a completely wrong question, Jesus meets him where he's at. He says, Jesus replied, well, what does the law of Moses say? So you're an expert in the law. What does the law of Moses say? And and he quotes this, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind. That's the lawyer quoting this to Jesus. Now, in Jesus' day, it, it, it was common... Uh, no, that was a known response. In fact, the religious leader is quoting the Old Testament law found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all of your strength. Now, the interesting part is this. And in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, Jesus had already taught on this. They had already had this like little showdown. And Matthew, who was an eyewitness, he records that the last time Jesus had this little interaction, he adds something to this and he silences the religious leaders, making fools out of them. So they had tried this before. In fact, in Mark 12, they're debating with Jesus to try to undermine his credibility. And he asks of all of the commands, which is the most important. So what's the bare minimum that we have to do? So which Jesus, uh, so do, do, I, do I really have to keep all of them to go to heaven? And, and here, here's where Jesus added what was written in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. He says, and love, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And before the religious leaders could stop him, Jesus added, as the second is equally important. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then I believe he just stares them in the eye when he says this. No other commandment is greater than these. So you got to get this right. And then the religious leaders, they walked away stunned. Now, because in that moment, Jesus had linked something. He, he had linked our love for God to our love for other people. Right? And so to Jesus, eternal life wasn't something that happens after you die. Jesus links our responsibility to bring heaven to earth right now here today. And that meant loving people. Can you just imagine a world where people were skeptical about what you and I believe, but they were envious of how well we loved one another, how well we treated one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the religious leaders had never heard that before. 
And so so they got together, they had their little powwow because they were stopped. So in Luke 10, they're coming back to Jesus. I've got a new plan. I'm gonna debate with Jesus about eternal life, but I'm gonna try to stump him. So the expert of the law quotes Jesus back to Jesus. First he uses the Old Testament. So the, the, the lawyer's saying this, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and with all of your mind. And then he adds Jesus' words back to Jesus, and love your neighbor as yourself, to which Jesus goes, bing, 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 bing. Like, you're right. <laughs> Jesus told them, do this, and you'll live. Now this is classic Jesus, because he turns to walk away. You're like, hey, just do that, and you're, you're going to be great. But, but, but the first part was the setup. Because this is a setup for what he's going to ask now. He says, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus. So here's the trap. Here's the qualifier. See, he's asking Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? In other words, since your last teaching, we all got the guys together, and, and you told us to truly love God. We had to love our neighbor, and we were overwhelmed by all of the need in the world, and we, you can't possibly expect us to love everybody. So who is my neighbor? Let's limit the definition of neighbor. Now, now the Hebrew word used for neighbor was this Hebrew word, re, right here, right? And, and, and so in the Old Testament law, they used this word. This word would suggest that when they thought of neighbor, it would be friend, companion, or brother, but what Jesus taught, it didn't jive with what they thought about when they thought about neighbor. Jesus was way too inclusive. And so when he, he goes to Jesus, he's trying to limit, like we try to limit, okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And here, in other words, here's the real question. <laughs> Jesus, what is the minimum amount of neighbor loving required in order to get God's favor? <laughs> Can I just do the bare minimum? Jesus, I'm okay with caring with people who look like me, talk like me, think like me, but not quite me, right? Jesus, I, I'm okay for caring for my family, but I'm overwhelmed by all of the need out there. And if I listen to you, Jesus, I just have too many neighbors. So I, I, I don't want my lack of care or concern for them to actually affect my standing with you. So what is the minimum amount of neighbor loving I've got to do to be right with God? Now, they, they wanted to choose heaven over hell, but they did not want to choose heaven over earth. So how can I make sure that I give God what he wants, but I still get to do everything that I want to do? Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, last year, we did this whole series trying to get to know our neighbor, and we introduced this whole concept called B-L-E-S-S, or we call it BLESS, right? We want this to be a part of the DNA of our church, so we're going to be talking about this in the future. And last fall, I gave you this neighborhood home chart where you got to go investigate your neighbors. You know, it's in your app or in your notes. If you haven't done it, or maybe you've had some people move in or move out, you'll want to go ahead and do that. And some of you told me, hey, Josh, my neighborhood does not look like a tic-tac-toe square. So you Google Earth your uh, eight closest neighbors and you got out your Mr. Rogers card again and you walked around spying, I mean, uh, getting to know your neighbors, you know, learning about your neighbors. And, and, because if Jesus links our treatment of our neighbors to our faith and how are we stand with God, that's a problem. And I already told you this, that Jesus t- told me, and I believe he says to love my neighbor, but if I was honest last year, I didn't even know my neighbor's names. And so I, I got out the chart and I went to work and I challenged you to go to work. And, and so we all did that in the fall and then winter came. So we probably went inside. So as we're headed towards summer, it's spring outside. It's nice outside. We want to be intentional as a church to, about this command of Jesus. So for the next month, the next 30 days, 28 days, it's February, but it's not. So the next, you know, 30 something, well, we, want, we want you to bless your neighbor. Now, what does bless stand for? If you remember, the B is pretty easy. Begin with prayer. So you don't even have to talk to them. You just begin with prayer. Right, so you're out and about this next month as a church. We want to pray specifically for our neighbors by name. So maybe you're taking a walk and you're just throwing up a prayer, like praying God. Don't say God help the lawn guy because he needs help with this. Like the, the, you know, by his name. Don't help the family with the trash can thing. Get their trash picked up on time. Don't, just use their name. And for the next month, we want to be going and we want to be praying for our neighbors by name. The second one is again easy. It's it's listen, right? So the L is listen. So sometime in the next month, you get to strike up a conversation with a neighbor and the purpose is only listening and learning. That's all you have to do. Just listen and learn about their story. And the E in bless is something you might be an expert in, right? The next month, just make a plan to eat. Have a meal with one of your neighbors. Uh, There's something about sharing a meal together that actually moves any relationship past acquaintance towards friendship. 
Now the first S is serve. And I'm convinced that if you begin with prayer, if you listen, if you eat with them, you'll find a chance, a place that you could serve your neighbor. And the last one is a really important one. It's, it's share your story. So when you bless others, there will come a moment, there'll come a time, there'll come an opportunity where they're like, what makes you different? Well, why do we have this relationship? And you will have the opportunity to share your story about the life-changing love of Jesus. Now, if you want help crafting your story, uh, we have some helps for you. It's on our website, victorycc.life slash stories. I'd love for you to, to know your story, right? And so just go there to get started. And we'll walk you through the rest of that. Um, for the next month, we want to focus on blessing our, our neighbors. And uh, if any of this like kind of overwhelm you, you're like, hey, Josh, I, I like the eat part and the pray part, but I'm not sure I want to share anything. Like if, if that seems like too much, then you know exactly how those religious leaders felt. They were overwhelmed by the command on their life. So his, his name, so he's like, hey, can, can my neighbor loving only be limited to these two houses? Because the people over here are pretty crazy. And Mr. Rogers tried to teach me, but Mr. Rogers did not teach me adequately enough to prepare me for the craziness of these neighbors over here. Can we just like say, hey, these guys are my neighbors. Jesus, let's be very specific. Who is my neighbor? We try to limit our neighbors. We try to limit who God calls us to to bless. And Jesus interrupts our regularly scheduled plans and he delivers a parable that you've heard before, even if you've never been to church before. It's a teaching from Jesus to his followers about what to do when, uh, when we're overwhelmed by the need in the world. And it starts off this way. It says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. So Jesus says, hey, there's this man He's out there. He's a sojourner in this world. He's a traveler in this world. And he's traveling down. This was a deep descent from Jerusalem down here to Jericho. So notice the elevation is steep. So in, in Jesus' parable, this is a real highway in Jesus' day called the Way of Blood. Can you just imagine navigating that? 17 miles of treacherous, rocky terrain. And Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. So this wasn't like once upon a time. This was on a road that they had experienced. Experience. Like, can you just imagine, like, you know, <laughs> planning the family vacation? Hey, load up the donkey, honey, because uh, we're going to take the kids to the way of blood. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. No, but it was called the way of blood because that stretch of road was actually known for people who got robbed, beat up, raped, and murdered. That's the way of blood. And Jewish historian Josephus cues us in on that. He, not only was Jesus confronting their concept of neighbor, Jesus was actually addressing a racial dynamic that was present in their culture. That it was actually going on. In fact, Josephus says the Samaritans killed a great many Gentiles who were en route to Jerusalem, from Jericho to Jerusalem. So the story, what Jesus was telling them was not like hypothetical. Like he was addressing their real life experience. So I just say a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. And they're like, oh, like last week, <laughs> right? They, they, probably, they probably thought that the person that beat him up was a dirty Samaritan, right? So, so, so he goes, this guy who was traveling, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. So you have this traveler, you have this adventurer out in the world, this sojourner out in the world, exploring the world, and so all of a sudden, life attacks him. All of a sudden, life left him dead on the, half dead on the side of the road. Have you ever felt that way? Uh, you're alive on the outside, but you kind of feel numb on the inside, dead on the inside? Does that resonate with anyone? Now, when, when was the last time you were living life, but your soul was worn out? You're living life, but your soul seems to be burnt out. You can't handle one more bad news. You can't, can't handle one more setback. Have you ever felt alive physically, but dead spiritually? By definition, you felt half dead. And Jesus tells us in this parable that there is this man attacked by life, half dead, lying on the side of the road. It says, by chance, a priest came along. And so there's this guy who would have been Jewish. He's the priest, right? This guy who represented God uh, in their mind in the picture. The priest sees the dying man. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side of the road and passed him by. Then, then check this out. This temple assistant <laughs> walked over and looked at him lying there. 
there, but he also passed by on the other side of the road. Can you just imagine that? Like, hey, what's over here going over here? Oh, you're half dead. All right, see you later. Like, I, that's, that's how he's telling the story. So, so this guy helped out in the temple a lot, but he, he's like, I got to get going on my way. So the Jewish religious leaders but believed, that, believed in something that Jesus' followers don't believe in. The Jewish religious leaders of that day believed in karma. They, they believe, okay, well, it goes around, comes around. They, they probably did something to deserve that. So they thought if you were bruised and bleeding on the side of the road, you probably did something in your life to deserve to be bruised and bleeding and left on the side of the road. I, I'm not going to go out of my way to help you because God is just giving you what you deserve. That's how they, they thought. And so Jesus, he keeps on teaching. And what was Jesus says next was so offensive in this setting. He says, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. To which the expert in the law has been thinking, oh, Jesus, you got to fix your story. Remember, he's, everybody he's talking to is Jewish in this moment. And he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. The best way to describe the tension between the Jews and the Samaritan was institutionalized racism. They wouldn't have anything to do with Samaritans. They wouldn't speak to them. They wouldn't touch them. They wouldn't touch things that they had touched. And so Jesus makes this despised Samaritan the hero of the story. And then check out what he does next. He, the Samaritan, put the man on his donkey and took him into an inn where he took care of him. And the next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins. So the Samaritan bandaged him up and put him on the donkey. And for some reason, Jesus wants us to know that the Samaritan takes this half dead man to an inn. And he stays there with the inn and takes care, with him, care for him for two days and leaves wages with him there. He says, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, in this account, the Jewish lawyer is trying to stump Jesus. So, so in this account, when Jesus is telling the story, who is this Jewish lawyer? Like, who, who's the person in the account where, is, who, who is Jesus saying, you're the Jewish lawyer? It's not the Samaritan. Is it the priest passing by on the side of the road? No, it's not him. Who is he? He's the man beaten up and left for dead, half dead on the side of the road. And I would like to suggest to you in this parable that Jesus is telling us that he is the Samaritan in this parable. And remember, the Samaritan was rejected by the Jews. And what what was said of Jesus, he was rejected by his own. So here comes this rejected Samaritan, rejected by his own people. So Jesus is saying, hey, this is me. And he sees a man who has rejected him before. And he sees a man who's overlooked him before. And and, and Jesus moves towards the pain and he moves towards the mess. And he comes down off his animal. He comes down. Does that sound familiar? Jesus comes down and he starts bandaging up the wounded, dying man. And where does he place the dying man? He places them back up on the animal where Jesus was. And so the man is seated where the Samaritan was. And the Samaritan is where the man was. They traded places. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, Jesus is preaching the gospel to these people. How how we traded places. Jesus shows us what it actually looks like to love your neighbor. And the kind of love that God has for you. And what it would look like to bless your neighbor. No, before you get too excited, think I'm going to ask you to wear a suit and ride a bicycle, go two by tour, knocking on doors, like looking for people who are hurting. I just want to make this clear that when Jesus spoke this parable, the Samaritan wasn't trying to convert the Jewish man. Do you see it anywhere in there? He said convert would mean to cause, to adopt a different religion, political doctrine, opinion, or etc. So nowhere in the text does it say the Samaritan actually converted the Jewish man. No, Jesus, as a Samaritan, simply blessed him. What's blessed? To enact goodness of any kind. He blessed him. And so as Jesus follows, when it comes to our neighbors, the goal is to bless them, not convert them. They're, they're, your neighbors are not projects. I'm asking you to bless them, not convert them. The goal goal isn't to convert people. The goal is to love well and bless people well. And they know it's because you are a Jesus follower. So, So we see Jesus blesses the man. Now check out how Jesus ends the story. He turns the religious, to the religious lawyer who tried to trap Jesus in his own words, but the lawyer now is trapped. L- look at what Jesus says. He turns to this expert of the law, expert of asking questions. He says, now which of these three would you say is a, was a neighbor to the man attacked by the bandits? And I love this because Jesus forces him to answer. And he says, the man replied, the one. See, he's so mad he can't even say Samaritan. <laughs> the one who showed mercy. Like, and then Jesus mic drops and says, yeah, just now go and do the same. 
Just classic Jesus, okay? This is what I'm telling you to do. You just go and live like that. And so the religious lawyer who is overwhelmed by the need of the world, he tries to limit which neighbor he has to bless. And Jesus, he just opens up this neighborhood chart that not just to the people on your block, but your neighbors are everybody you come into contact with at work, everybody you go to school with. Your neighbors are the people you sit next to on the baseball fields or the soccer field or the basketball court or wherever. Jesus opens up the, this whole concept of neighbor to include anyone and everyone but one of the things that Jesus adds to the account that, that he didn't really have to add to the account, I, this is the part that normally gets skipped over, but, but as I look at the account, my question is simply this. Why did Jesus include the N in this parable? Like what, what's going on with the N in this parable? You can look back in verse 34. He put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Why did Jesus make that part of the story up? Because he could have made this point without, you know, making this part up. He, he, he was delivering a revealing point to the lawyer about how he should bless his neighbor. He could have done that without including the part about the end. So why did Jesus include the, par- the part of the end in the parable? And I'd like to suggest to you that maybe, just maybe, Jesus is hinting at the kind of church that he was going to build. So remember last week I, I mentioned that Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi and there's a nickname in the day for Caesarea Philippi. It was called the gates of hell. And it was in that, this parable and in that location where Jesus first announced his church that he, he makes this announcement, my church, my people are to bless the people who are going through hell. That's what my church is for. So your role in bringing heaven to earth is actually to go and bless the people who are living at the gates of hell. And this parable, after, this parable, after Jesus blesses the guy, he takes him to the inn. And Jesus is hinting that the inn is the church. It's supposed to be, the church is supposed to be more like the inn. And the church should be the place where the people who are hurting, the people who are going through hell here on earth can actually heal. The church should be the place where the half dead find new life. It says the Samaritan picked him up and took him to the inn where he took care of him. To which we're like Jesus. Maybe you thought this. Why didn't Jesus just take him home? Because home is heaven. And this guy's half dead going through hell. He wasn't prepared for home. He was going through stuff in his life. He was not ready for heaven. And so Jesus drops him off at his church. And Jesus says to his followers, Jesus says to his church, well, my church should be a beacon of hope in the middle of people who are going through hell. We should go to the pain. We should not be removed from pain. Jesus says to our church, Victory, you should look more like an emergency room than a country club. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like pain. <laughs> I'd rather avoid pain. Some of you are crazy. You're like, no pain, no gain. I like Advil, right? <laughs> But when you consider who our hero is, Jesus did not avoid pain. Jesus' very presence in this world is an exercise in him moving towards the pain. In fact, scripture reveals that the church is his body, which means what is true of Jesus personally should be true of us collectively. If we are part of the body of Christ, we should look like Jesus and we should act like Jesus and we should move towards pain like Jesus did. We need to be the kind of church that moves towards pain. So where in your neighborhood is there pain? Where in your realm of influence are there broken and hurting people? I wonder if God would send us there. To which you might say, Joshua, are you talking about planting little churches in all of these communities? Like, are we going to plant little churches in these neighborhoods? Are we build, talking about building other locations? No, hear me. We are already walking, talking locations. The church is not a building. The church is you. The church is me. We don't go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We are called to move towards the pain, not run from it. And the first words of the Samaritan to the innkeeper was simply this, take care of this man. And when I read that, these words hit me like a ton of bricks. Because in these words, Jesus commands us to care. Take care of him. But Jesus, what's his story? I don't care. Take care of him. But Jesus, how did he get this way? It doesn't matter. Take care of him. But Jesus, what's his background? It doesn't matter. Take care of him. But Jesus, does he believe all the right things? It does not matter. Take care of him. Jesus, how did he vote? It does not matter. Take care of him. Do you see any distinction? Do you see any definition? Take care of him. Jesus said, "Never worry, don't worry about this. He didn't do this to himself. He was attacked. He didn't deserve this. No, Jesus commands us to care. But Jesus, he's a drug user. It doesn't matter. Take care of him. He's an embezzler. It doesn't matter. Take care of him. Jesus, what are you trying to tell me? 
Jesus saying, I, you're supposed to tell, are you telling me that we're trying to care for everybody that comes through those doors? Jesus would say, yeah, I'm commanding you to care. In victory, we reserve the right to care for anyone and everyone. Anyone and everyone because Jesus commands us to care. In fact, I wonder if we're living the way that Jesus calls us to live, if you and I are not being criticized about who we care about. Do you remember what Jesus was criticized about in Luke 15 when the religious leaders complained that Jesus was hanging out with those sinners? He accepts them. He befriends them. We think that he even likes them. <laughs> that was what was said of Jesus. And now, now there's a difference between acceptance and approval. Just so you know, acceptance and approval is different. But, but as you're overwhelmed by the need in the world, let me just ask you this question. It's, we're guilty of all, of, all of us are guilty of it. Who have we, who have you, excuse yourself, I'm caring about? Who is it? Because we all do it. What kind of people do you excuse yourself from caring about? <laughs> Josh, they got themselves into this mess. I'm not saying you approve of the mess that they're in, but do they know you care? Do they feel accepted by you? Will they be blessed by you? Who have you excused yourself from caring about? See, Jesus is teaching that we're all God's children. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in his sight. I mean, can you imagine if you came up to me after church and said, hey, Josh, I love the church. The church is great. I, I think you did a great job in the message. You're awesome. You're a great guy. I can tell you really love Jesus, right? I'm so glad to be a part of Victory, right? And I love your family. Your family's amazing. Your wife, she's fantastic. Your kids are awesome, except the youngest one. The youngest one, Car uh, Carter, I, he's terrible. I, I, you know, there's something wrong with that kid. Uh, Josh, you probably know this. I'm just keeping it real, right? I love you. You're great, but Carter, eh, you know, I promise you, after I engaged your face with my fist, right, you experience a smackdown in the name of Jesus, right? <laughs> I'll ask you to forgive me, and I'll have to forgive you because I follow Jesus, right? But, but here's when we exclude ourselves from caring people, from people, that's what we do. God, I love you. I just don't like all your kids. God, I love singing to you. I love reading your books. I even highlight stuff you said. Boy, you're a good, good father. I love you. I just don't like that kid over there. You know you messed up on that one, right? You made a mistake over there, right? Do you think your heavenly father looks at you and says, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I get it. They're, they're totally messed up. No, he doesn't. He says, they're all my children. We're all his kids. He loves us all. In the kingdom of God, there are no good kids or bad kids. There are lost kids and found kids. And so, who have we excluded ourselves from caring about? And can we be the kind of church that is courageous enough to get rid of, remove, or reject the idea that some people can be overlooked, that some people can be ignored, that some people can, or just cannot be loved? That is not the heart of the Father. No, Jesus, he commands us to care. In fact, the very night before he goes to the cross, he gathers the disciples together around one last time. He says, a new command, I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must, this is not a choice, you must love one another. Will we be a church that cares? Can, can we be a church that blesses hopeless people? Will we take steps towards loving our neighbors even when it's messy? See, I know you won't have all of the answers, right? They might not have taught you that in Bible college, but Jesus never commanded you to be an annoying know-it-all. That's not the command. The command is to bless your neighbor, to love your neighbor, to care for your neighbor. And maybe you're here today and you aren't a Jesus follower and life is just beating you up and you feel broken down. Just so you know, you can look around the room. At some point in our life, we felt that too. You're not alone. You've come to the right place to heal. And you need to hear that God's not scared of your mess. He knows. And he loves you anyway. And you might be thinking, that's great, Josh, but you never answered the question. What do I do when I'm overwhelmed by need in the world? I just want to point you to the words of Jesus as he closes out this, uh, this story that he made up. He said, now which of these would you say was a neighbor? And from the text, it's clear. Oh, Jesus, the one who saw a need and met it. The one who knew the price and paid it. And the one who didn't talk themselves out of it, right? This is the genius of Jesus. Jesus reverses the question and says, when you are overwhelmed, right, don't think about who they are, but, re but think about who you are. See, the point isn't about limiting our neighbors. The point is about doing the bare minimum. The point is just us, us, us being who God has called us to be, remembering who, who we are. 
The point is not to say, hey, they don't deserve it and they do. That's not the point. The point is blessing people because we are children of God. Don't think about who they are, but we're doing it because of who we are. And as you bless your neighbor, remember that Jesus is a true neighbor. A true neighbor. A true neighbor is the one who saw a need and met it. The one who knew the price and paid it. And the one who didn't talk themselves out of it. And I believe that as Jesus would wrap up this morning, he would say to you what he said to that man that day. Now go and do the same. Now go and do the same. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for rescuing each and every one of us. And I want to confess that so many of us are like the lawyer. Even right now, we're arguing you, with you in our head. Exactly how much do we have to give up or where do we have to go? Or God, could you just... In the midst of all of that, just give us the courage to keep our hands open. And whether we follow Jesus or not, Father, would you just help all of us to stay open to whatever it is you want to do through us. And I pray before this week is done that a whole bunch of us will have seen a need and met it, found a price and paid it, and they would, we would quit talking ourselves out of it. Heavenly Father, thank you for not talking, talking yourself out of sending your son to die for us. We look forward to what you will do through us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Every single one of us has a next step. Maybe you need some prayer. Maybe you're hurting today. If you're in, the, in person here, it's out the door and to the left is our next steps room. If you're watching online, just text next to 317. I should have that memorized. There you go. 576-2288. I say it enough, right? You'd think that I'd have it memorized. And remember here at Victor, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. And may we be good news this week. Have a great week.